Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on artificial intelligence and sustainable chemistry. My name is Sarah Cottle, and I am a senior editor at Chemical and Engineering News. I have the pleasure of moderating today's event on behalf of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. The Roundtable provides a neutral forum to advance the understanding of issues of importance to the chemical sciences and engineering, and promotes the exchange of information among government, industry, non-government organizations, and academic sectors. A complete schedule of CSR's upcoming events and registrations are available online. Two links are posted in the chat and a QR code is available to scan on the screen. To receive direct communication about future CSR events, subscribe to the CSR newsletter. That link is also posted in the chat and a QR code is available to scan on the screen. This year, CSR is devoting their webinar series to artificial intelligence and its role in scalability, limited data, and today's topic, which is sustainable chemistry. Today, we will first set the stage on how sustainable chemistry, AI, and machine learning are defined, then take a deep dive on how these two topics intersect and the societal problems that could be solved using this new blend of science and technology. The format will be an open dialogue between our two guest speakers, which means there will be plenty of time for questions throughout the discussion. Your questions can be submitted via the Q and A button on Zoom, which is located in the bottom control panel. The recording of today's conversation will also be posted online. I would like to take this moment to first Acknowledge the staff for organizing this event and the CSR members and ex officio members for their hard work in setting the blueprint for CSR's activities and the Department of Energy and National Science Foundation for their continual support of the roundtable. Secondly, I'd like to give a huge thank you to CSR members Dr. Adelina Vuchkova and Dr. Jonathan Wild for their thoughtful contribu contributions in developing today's program and nominating our guests. With that, I would like to introduce our guest, Drs. Jake Grace and Matt Sigmund. Hi. Dr. Grace's chemical sciences expertise comes from his knowledge of organometallic chemistry and experience with laboratory automation strategies, digitalization solutions, and workflow design and implementation for R&D in the chemical industry. Currently, Jake and the HTE team focus on increasing Clarion's knowledge base through vast design, through vast data generation in application areas such as oil fields, mining, industrial applications, crop solutions, personal and home care, and healthcare. The HTE team, in, collabor in collaboration with Clarion's application specialist, data science team, and IT department, are engaged in digitalization initiatives through building data sets to enable the use of artificial intelligence to help better serve Clarion's customers and the planet. Dr. Sigmund's research integrates the study and development of new chemical reactions with the invention of new data science approaches to reaction interrogation. The Sigmund lab blends physical organic chemistry techniques and data science to develop new reactions with broad applications. From enantioselective synthesis to energy related topics to biologically inspired reactions. He has been recognized by the University of Utah for his teaching with the Distinguished Teaching Award and has received recognition for his research efforts with the ACS Award for Creative Work in Synthetic Organic Chemistry. So again, thank you all for being here today. I think we're going to have a great dialogue. And with that said, 
um, let's get started. For context in this conversation and understanding where Jake and Matt are coming from, I will define sustainable chemistry, artificial intelligence, and, and machine learning. So we're all on the same page going into this. Sustainable chemistry, as defined by the Office of Science and Technology Policy, is the chemistry that produces compounds or materials from building blocks, regents, and catalysts that are readily available and renewable, operates at optimal efficiency, and employs renewable energy sources. This includes the intentional design, manufacture, use, and end-of-life management of chemicals, materials, and products across their life cycle that do not adversely impact human health and environment while promoting circularity, meeting societal needs, contributing to economic resilience, and aspiring to perpetually use elements, compounds, and materials without depletion of resources or accumulation of waste. Artificial intelligence is a broad field which refers to the use of technologies to build machines and computers that have the ability to mimic cognitive functions associated with human intelligence, such as being able to see, understand, and respond to spoken or written language, analyze data, make recommendations, and more. Although artificial intelligence is often thought of as a system in itself, it is a set of technologies implemented in a system to enable it to reason, learn, and act to solve a complex problem. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence that automatically enables a machine or system to learn and improve from experience. Instead of explicit programming, machine learning uses algorithms to analyze large amounts of data, learn from the insights, and then make informed decisions. Machine learning algorithms improve performance over time as they are trained or exposed to more data. Machine learning models are the output or what the program learns from running an algorithm on training data. The more data used, the better the model will get. So how are AI and ML connected? While AI and ML are not quite the same thing, they are closely connected. The simplest way to understand how AI and ML relate to each other is sort of saying that AI is the broader concept of enabling a machine or system to sense, reason, act, or adapt like a human, while ML is an application of AI that allows machines to extract knowledge from data and learn from it autonomously. A helpful way to remember the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence is to imagine them as umbrella categories. Artificial intelligence is the overarching term that covers a wide variety of specific approaches and algorithms. Machine learning sits under that umbrella, but so do other major subfields, such as deep learning, robotics, expert systems, and natural language processing. So, uh, Matt, Jake, I'll turn it over to you all by first asking if you all can give us any examples of how your group has used AI to address sustainability problems. Can't remember who goes first. Sounds like you, Matt. Okay. <laughs> all right. So um, my group is, is you've nicely described what my group does in, in the intro, Sarah. Um, my group I'll just talk about some recent applications and sustainability is we've been involved in a few um, very large um, consortia um, that have been funded. One is in the area of battery research or flow battery research. It's called J. Caesar, and it just finished as a DOE hub. And um, our goal there was to use reasonably simple machine learning models to predict and optimize the stability on the energy efficiency of electrolytes for flow batteries, organic electrolytes. And that's, you know, simply put, what we would do is we would build a training set of molecules. We would measure some of their properties, and then we use structure property relationships um, to then extrapolate to better performing examples. 
Um, more recently, we're very interested in, in renewable polymers, and I'm involved in an EFRC um, that's centered at University of Illinois called REMAT. And in this case, we're trying to um, help design both the synthesis of the polymers, but how they will be deconstructed ultimately at their end of life cycle. And so those are just two kind of more recent sustainability driven ones. We also work in chemical reaction space as well, but maybe we'll also come up a little later. Lovely. Thanks, Matt. Um, so yeah, I would I would love to be able to say that that we've done lots of projects using AI to bring forward sustainability, but it, it's not actually the case yet. I think um, I'll start off make a comment about sustainability. Clarion, part of its mission is to be safe and sustainable in everything we do. So sustainability is a big issue and it's, I think, part of all, it runs through all of the projects that, that we work on. We, as high throughput experimentation, fit into a gap where, I mean, essentially Clarion is making components for other people's products. So we make the uh, surfactants for shampoos, conditioners for, yeah, emollients for conditioners and, and, and other personal care products, dispersing agents for, for coatings, um, oil field, uh, chemicals for oil field, getting oil out of the ground or for, for refinery. Um, and, and as high throughput, we work as essentially a, a, a testing service. So the products come from the synthesis labs and we test them in the, in the customer chassis, essentially. So, and, and, and how we do that. So we use certain principles. Um, we use computational tools. AI, I think, will become a big part of that in the future. We're not quite there with that yet, but I think I'll focus on that a little bit later. We, we use a principle of miniaturization. So typically in the application labs or the synthesis labs, they, they make stuff on a kilo scale. Mm -hmm. it, it's still big traditional chemistry. We look to scale that down so we're typically working at the sort of 20 to, to a two gram to 20 gram scale by scaling things down that m massively reduces the amount of weight waste we produce so we've got less waste it also reduces cost per experiment so it allows us to do a lot more we, we do our experiments in parallel so we can do more and we use automation to make us more efficient so we're more efficient we're faster in the testing phase of making sure that that the products work. Um, I think this gives us a certain amount of horsepower for generating data. And I think this is, this is the key when we come to utilize AI is having data sets which cover the experimental space correctly so we've got enough coverage of the experimental space also that we we need data we can trust so you know we've worked on standardizing the way we do things so that you know we not necessarily always get the same result every time but we understand the noise within our experimental limits so we can trust the data we're standardizing the structure of the data to make it easier for when we start using machine learning tools um, because I think that's a big challenge for working with legacy data is it's not always in a good format for machines to read. Um, and uh, I think the, the, the final piece of the puzzle there is we need that data then to be accessible, to be findable. Um, so we're, we're working towards fair data principles to, to make our transition to AI is as straightforward as possible. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, I think what you touched on at the end there goes perfectly into um, our first question. And Matt, maybe you'd like to start um, from your perspective with your work. Um, what are some threats that you perceive for AI and sustainability? Yeah, I think Jake hit the 
you know, hit the most most difficult part of the whole enterprise. I, I think the algorithms that are available are certainly suitable for most applications, but we have a massive um, problem with data. And then also in chemistry, we have even more interesting problems with how you describe chemical molecules to build models. So the data problem is something that I know my team and, and many teams that I work with think about a lot, both in industrial collaborations and, and within academic collaborations is, uh, and I know you have another topic on this a little while later, but the sparsity of quality data that's already embedded in the literature is a, is a massive issue. It's not necessarily re ready for ML tasks. And uh, importantly, mostly it's not been intentionally designed in any way, shape or form to be used in any type of algorithm. And so I think what Jake was speaking to is perfect. It's like, how do you build, you know, build now um, the tools to design the proper data sets that are ready to go through, you know, some sort of featureization and then and ultimately model building for building machine learning models that predict, which then feed into some sort of AI. Um, you know, AI is something we I know we'll probably talk about a little bit later. It's a somewhat controversial terminology, but machine learning is pretty much the engine that's going to be driving most of chemical research for the near future. Um, and uh, data is the problem. I will want to speak about real quickly the features of molecules. And this is, uh, I, I will say, where my group is really invested almost the decades at work um, trying to understand how to best featureize molecules and what for for which objective and, um, you know, ultimately, you know, what I like to tell computer scientists is that benzene looks like a really simple molecule. And I think organic chemists and chemists and, well, are delighted to tell them that it's not, because if you put one substituent on benzene, all of a sudden, every carbon, if you approach some sort of probe is now not necessarily the same. And how do you make the machine understand that is, is, and, and use that information in building models is, is again, something my group has dedicated a good amount of the last decade to. Um, and we can talk more depth about that, but that's, you know, I think that's what makes chemistry unique um, in machine learning. If you add on top of the, the sparsity of data is that how you describe molecules, you have free sparse data. And finally, the last thing maybe I'll mention is data that's in the literature is extremely biased to things that have worked. And this is, again, a cultural and community issue that is going to change over time, but it's going to take some time. But that means historical data is definitely missing a lot of information about what won't work. And the rule of thumb of building models is if you don't tell the, if you don't tell the algorithm what doesn't work, you can't predict what doesn't work. So you need that information as part of the, um, part of the operation. So that's my sh shorter answer to a topic that we speak about in great detail within my group and, and, and in the collaborations I'm involved in. It actually rem reminds me of, uh, so I guess, 15, 20 years ago, um, in, in, a, in a different life, I, I spent a lot of time at drug discovery conferences. <laughs> and um, at that point in time, a lot of academics were trying to develop software for, for modeling protein drug interactions. And, and their biggest complaint at that point in time is nobody publishes the negative results. <laughs> if you could share your negative results with us, we could make this so much better. But of course, no one did. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> and, and, and I think, you know, for us, we're, you know, for me, I want to make sure we capture, you know, people talk about well, what do we do if the experiment doesn't work? It's fine. I mean, if we dispense the wrong amount in there, this is potentially useful data still. We don't, we don't scrub anything. We don't get rid of anything. It, it may, it may be useless, but it may prove useful at some point in time. So keeping the data, keeping everything, I mean, and then for us, you know, we're working with automation. It, it's mature. The technology is maturing. It, it's a lot better than it was 15 years ago. There, there, is, there are still things that go wrong. So keeping all of 
the information about the errors that happen, the mistakes that go on, allows us to improve the process as we go. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think what both of you said, um, maybe more specifically, um, and I know, Matt, you're kind of coming from academia, and Jake, you're a little bit in industry here. Um, how do you think AI will impact the collaboration culture in advancing AI and sustainable chemistry research? I mean, it's such an interesting question. And, you know, I'm in a unique position because I do collaborate pretty extensively with companies, usually on very specific, almost academic like projects, but occasionally with pipeline projects. And, um, what I love about industry is they love the concept of technology way more than most academics do because that because they are they are on the money and time are correlated um, in industry and sustainability is connected to all of this as well. Um, and so they really think of these types of tools as um, a way to streamline kind of making it through the more mundane aspects of the job right so i have to optimize a reaction this is actually very difficult when you have seven variables in such a reaction and you know how do i streamline that with some sort of uh, machine learning tool set and so they are embracing that and so um the issue i think at hand what you're kind of i think alluding to with your question is um i think they're going to the uptick of that kind of workflow in industry is going to be way faster than academics. However, the and this goes to Jake's point on the medicinal chemistry uh, experience he had, and it's still true to today. Is companies are all basically they are the they are where all of the data that is high quality lives, right? Um, academics don't have the tools nor the infrastructure mm -hmm. to do HT kind of on scale like you do in a company. So if that data is not available, all of the machine learning models that are going to be built from academic labs are just not going to be seeing this really wonderful and diverse data. And therefore, I'm concerned that, you know, everyone's going to kind of do the same thing in every company. And then everyone's going to do kind of the same thing in academics. And we're seeing that somewhat already today, although we're in early days, so it's less important for vetting technology. But ultimately, if you want reaction predictors or optimization predictors that are really much more holistic, you're going to need all this data, right? So the question I think that that's at the core of this is how do we get companies and consortia to agree upon sharing data that is not extremely vital for their protected information? Um, and I think the chemists get this. I think it's, you know, we can speak about, you know, I think the politics and the lawyering is a little more complex and not really a part of our discussion, maybe. But that's 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 the issue I see at hand um, is that the, it still comes back to data in the end. So companies are going to embrace this. They're, they're going to be collaborative. They're going to be collaborative very specifically, but they're going to have tons and tons of great data that would ultimately feed models that are way more holistic. And I'm hoping that that some somehow some way that gets dealt with. I I think there's a we I, I think we 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 need to collaborate to make these things work. I think as as Matt says, we we have a lot of data, although a lot of our legacy data is perhaps not in. The, the shape we'd like it to be in, uh, <laughs> be utilized. But but I think the one of the challenges for us and one of the reasons I think we haven't jumped in with two feet on AI yet is because it it means doing things a little bit differently. Yeah. And and it means and re realistically, you know, we're working on specific projects. Those projects have a budget. They have a timeline. They have a certain amount of resources, and um, and that's what we have. And as a company, we're putting a lot of effort into evaluating how we can use AI because it's because there's a lot of hype at the moment. <laughs> and I and I think 
going back to the threat question, I think the hype around AI, I, I perceive as a bit of a threat at the moment. I, I, I come back to that a little bit later, maybe. Um, so I think for us, we need the right project to, to test the AI. But I think, so then we need collaboration from, from academics or, or other partners where the AI is, is at a certain level for the problems that, that we want to tackle with it. Um, and as I said before, we're, we're working hard to make sure that we've got the infrastructure in place because, yeah, I mean, you, you need the right, you need data repositories, you need the standardized data, you need, you need the algorithms from somewhere. Um, you know, we have a very good data science department in-house, mainly focused on the production side of things. But, you know, we're doing a lot of work with them at the moment on, on laboratory data, but typically laboratory data is very different from the, the sort of data that's coming from off the plants. You know, there's a lot of time resolved temperature and pressure and, and, and so on. Our data is a bit more complex, different format. So this has been a bit of a challenge. Um, also, we, you know, we have to collaborate, you know, so there's a lot big collaboration just within our company to make these things work because we need high throughput to do the experimentation. We need data science to, to curate the data. We need IT to put the infrastructure in place so that we can store the data, we can access the data. I think we we don't stand a chance getting this right unless we have the right collaborations in place. Absolutely. Um, and moving on from collaborations, and I know you mentioned a, a couple of different um, types of, of teams to make this work. Um, how do you think we can incorporate education or workforce development in using uh, these approaches? Like how important is it to keep humans at the center of uh, self-driving labs? I guess uh, who, I'll start and um, I mean, Jake probably can comment on it. We have two different points of view here. Uh, I see them early and Jake sees them later. Um, <laughs> but uh you know, the, two, the term I've been using a lot lately is chemist in the loop in terms of the self-driving labs. And maybe I'll come back to that. But the education part is I'm extremely passionate about this on a number of levels from just teaching in a course, a classroom to giving, getting some of our tools available and accessible um, to the more general uh, chemistry uh, um, trainees that are out there. Um but I think we're going to have to start thinking, I, I know, actually, we need to start thinking about how we revamp all of our curricula around the idea of integrating data science tools, um, it, chemists, biologists, physicists, I don't think it matters what the science is. Um, and, you know, the, if you, you may or may not, the people on the call may or may not be aware of this, but the way we teach chemistry in most universities is exactly the same way we taught it 50 years ago. The, you know, the textbooks have changed. We are, you know, some of the content has changed, but the general philosophy and also order of events is pretty similar that it was 50 years ago. And um, I think, you know, with it, it just not just modernization with data science, but all the kind of more technologies that are, are integrated in the chemistry enterprise, I think we do a disservice to our students and how we're teaching undergraduate education. Now, graduate edu education is much more flexible and much more dynamic. And therefore, I think we we can make up for that. Um, and I, you know, I'll just tell a couple of cool stories. I mean, I have I I'm an organic chemist, organometallic chemist, and almost everyone that joins my group comes back come from background either as a graduate student coming in as a postdoc or an undergrad coming in as a graduate student with a you know some sort of focus on organic chemistry. Very few are either computational or data science oriented folks. So. What's cool is that, you know, a first year graduate student or incoming postdoc, they are super excited to learn how to do this stuff. And they are very, very quick to learn it. And that's the right stage to do it because they have the time and the and the necessary guidance around them to learn 
techniques that are outside of their field. That's what you learn as a PhD student or a postdoc. I think the hard part is the workforce education. Once you've already gotten into the workforce, how do you teach a, an old chemist new tricks is maybe um, <laughs> a, a thought process here. But I mean, we have done a little bit of outreach in that regard. And we've had people visit my labs. And I know in some of my collaborators' labs, this is also true. But I think we need to, again, consider how that would look. And um, I have ideas, of course, but none of them are like you know, off the shelf, easy to do. Um, you know, except go learn Python is like the, the first thing I always tell people, even though I don't know how to use it myself, unfortunately, because I don't have time because I'm an old dog. <laughs> but I guess I'm putting this into perspective is, you know, the workforce education, both the emerging workforce and the current workforce are going to need to be educated to talk to the data scientists, because I do believe strongly you need a chemist in the loo, right? You need to know some chemistry to understand the questions, the hypotheses, and what the data may be telling you. Um, and I'm I, I'm an advocate of this. And for those who think that AI are going to basically control our plants anytime soon, haven't done the chemical reaction recently. So it's not that easy. It's it's actually very very difficult to do a complex chemical reaction. So I'll I'll, I'll let Jake take the the next stab at this one. It's a great question though. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So I I think. Yeah, people typically come to us, um, and I mean, high throughput in chemistry in in Clarion is fairly young. We're we're about a decade old, is all. And and I mean, we have a decent sized team now, but you know, we we've, we've taken people from within the organisation who haven't necessarily come with any background in high throughput experimentation or or even in engineering you know m most people are are chemists i'm very i'm very lucky to have a couple of engineers in my team who bring that perspective and 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 have that knowledge and and, and understand certain software development and so you know they've helped us put the right infrastructure in place for when when we're writing code and making sure we have the right source code control in place and, and things like that but yeah trying to teach the old chemists new tricks is 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 difficult because the the day job is is pretty intense you know we've got a lot to do there's a lot of pressure on generating results and you know we we've, we've done training in in certain areas you know we've looked okay this software package will will start trying to learn this software package we do a training session but then if you're not totally and utterly focused on keeping the momentum after that training session and if it's not part of the day job it, it it's super hard to to keep the momentum up to get to a sufficient level where you can make it useful within the day job so it's uh, it, it's a big challenge i think yeah, but it, it, it's a problem we, <laughs> we need to solve because yeah the, these are things i think we need to know i definitely we, we we don't necessarily have to be experts but we need to have enough of an understanding so that we can explain then to the experts what we need <laughs> I, I, I equate this often to operating NMR, right? Which is a common technique for chemists, you know. Yeah. NMR is, is you know, a common technique, but I would tell most organic chemists do not understand the physics behind NMR, but they have to be able to operate it and interpret what it says. And I think that's the same same idea with, with most data science techniques, um, especially if you can communicate that to someone who is more sophisticated in the, you know, algorithm side, especially. Absolutely. Um, so we have a couple of audience questions that have come in uh, since that oh, no. uh, <laughs> great question you all answered. Um, this one, maybe Matt, you might want to start with um, from Susan here. What advice do you have for a synthetic chemist in academia who sees the potential of AI and ML in their work 
and wants to begin to incorporate AI ML into their research, but when they have no prior experience um, in either of those things, um, aside from finding suitable collaborators, are there any training courses or additional skills that should be prioritized as a starting point? Yeah, this is a really hard question to answer in a, in, in this kind of format because, you know, the question I would come back with is, you know, what are your experiences with using computers? You know, have you done any kind of basic computational work before? That's kind of a starting point. Um, but the reality is there are a ton of resources to learn how to use basic machine learning techniques. Um, there are an incredible number of open source um, platforms that are teaching platforms. So um, we have a number that we suggest. I won't advertise them here because they're commercial things, but um, we have a number we suggest that folks look to when they join my lab. Um, but the reality is, and it's and it's a, it's a tough reality, is. Um, the only way you learn how to do stuff of this sort is to do it. And it's like almost anything else. And I, I would say that, um, you know, the way my group has learned this was extremely organic um, because we, we started thinking about the question of like, how are we gonna optimize a certain reaction with this limited data set and our intuition is not working properly. That was the origin story for all the stuff we did now starting 15 years ago. And that evolves over many, many years, many postdocs and, and graduate students who then learn new techniques, brought them into the lab, explained it to people. So the way to do it, I think nowadays is there are, there are courses online, there's resources through a couple of the centers I'm involved in that are, are pretty nice um, to get started. But I strongly suggest you got a, you get a student that's interested, you send them to the lab that does it and let them be there for a couple months and learn it. And that's hands-on learning is by far the most effective. And we've hosted a good number of students through the years and it's been really, really productive, both in you know making new relationships, but also seeing the students kind of pick it up. And like I said earlier, graduate students are much more apt if they don't have an extra day job to be able to learn these techniques. They have to want to do it. And I think that's the point I would make. If you wanna do it as a PI, I would say that's a really challenging thing because I, I know what it's like to be a PI and a professor and that's uh, that's a day job, right? You can't learn this on your own. So um, if you want to, you can certainly contact me offline and I can give you more kind of direct advice as well. That's great. I, I could add a little bit to that i i think it, the ai itself has sort of brought opportunity in in this space i think so the the generative generative ai solutions that are out there now um this is the sort of thing you can do you can you can ask like what's the best way for me for me to learn to code with python what's what's the best open source machine learning program you can go to it ask it you can even ask them okay so i want to learn this thing what should i do and you keep that conversation you can keep that conversation going and 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 get to a pretty decent place absolutely but as matt says you've got to want to do it <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a it's not easy. It's not like you press a button and you're good at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, I think yeah, no, I think uh Jake, what you just touched on um really relates quite well to um an audience question for both of you, and maybe you would like to expand on what you've said. Um so from nausea here, although we're getting very much AI dependent, um, do we need to stop our students? to stop using AI for uh, assessments or assignments, or do we need to guide them to learn to handle it better? I would say the second option, probably. The genie is out of the bottle is the way I like <laughs> about it. Because, like, there's I mean, no going back on this, so we have to either embrace it 
or we have to act like we're very old and didn't know it happened. Sorry, Jake. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I totally agree. I, I think people are going to use it, right? And <laughs> why shouldn't they? Um, I, I think the, um, the, the, the thing now is we can either embrace this, use it, and, and make ourselves better, or we can ignore it and, and, and fall by the wayside. Um, and, and I think you know, it, it, it's going to be the way we do things. So, I, I think it, it, it levels the playing field a little bit. But, uh, but I still think, you know, the more creative, harder working people will, will still rise to the top. I, I, I don't I, I, I don't see that it's a, a big problem because everyone will use it. And, and some people will be better at using it than others. And, and yeah, we're in the same place that we were. But with better and faster results, hopefully so. Now, I'll just add with the educational mission, there are certain things you need to consider very carefully on how you how you design assignments and such. And, um, <clears throat> and I think in the chemical areas, this is actually an advantage rather than a disadvantage, you know, my my opinion. I think when a class that's on writing, this becomes a little more challenging in how you, you know, define a writing assignment or something like that. In chemistry, no, I think this is great. I mean, there's chemistry is hard, right? Chemistry is complex, deep, and none of us know everything. So having an assistant of some sort through, you know, through hypothesis design and analysis of information just seems appropriate for a topic that's really hard. Um, you know, one of the things one of my former colleagues loved to say is once you get past six carbons, all bets are off. Right. And it's I would say it's even less carbons, to be honest. But, you know, it's, there's a lot we don't understand. And there's and, and using these tools, both the both to analyze and interpret it and design seem like we should embrace it with the caveats of how you best educate new people. They can't be told the answer. They have to find the answer. Right. So. But that's that's subtlety. Definitely. Um, and Matt, we uh, have another question specifically for you from Gerard oh. here um, that might go a little bit with what you just said. Um, so Gerard says, Matt advanced that the industry is better prepared than academia with the data and record infrastructure. Um, could you comment on whether the same is true for polymeric materials or would polymer deserve to have a more intentional, arguably the most empirical field of chemistry and yet critical to develop sustainable solutions? Well, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, there's this, uh, what do they call it? The material, I cannot, I just totally space the material project that a bunch of folks have been working on um, in the area of, machine learning, predicting polymer properties and, and, and sorts. And there's a big database of this. I'm not super familiar with it because I'm not working in that space. Um, I think, you know, the, the question is right on, which is it's that's even more empirical, I would say, than kind of traditional organic chemistry. Um, but the problems I think are, are, are the same. It's like, how do you know you know, how a catalyst will make a polymer or how do you know what the polymer properties are going to be when you adjust these conditions. I feel like algorithms should be able to, to do this. The hardest part is the data as well. It's the same problem. And then the experimentalist, I think, side of, of polymer chemistry is also very complex. Um, you know, what temperature do you initiate your polymerization and what are the concentrations of all the reagents and all this stuff become extremely important. And I think in organic chemistry, this is also true, but there's probably a little bit more flexibility in how reactions are run and reproduced. Um, so, I mean, I don't really answer the question. I think the same guiding principles though apply. And in, in our early days working with a EFRC on this, 
Yeah, it's it's a challenging problem, but you know, we we have already made some advances, you know, kind of taking baby steps and it's like any other good science project. You ask a, a reasonable hypothesis, you design your experiments properly, you analyze your data, you build a model, you test that model, and if it break it, you have to then figure out why it broke and you reiterate. It's the scientific project doesn't change when you do machine learning, by the way. None of that changes. Good hypothesis, intentional design of experiments, do the experiments properly, get the data, build a model, try to break it, validate it, done. Right? Same with a little math in between. <laughs> I, th I think there's there's actually a, there's an extra element to, to typically to polymosynthesis, and and that's the sort of the, the process of it. Yeah. So and and I, you go into the process. Temperature becomes important. Perhaps stirring rate becomes important. Feeding rate of of initiators and and monomers. These sorts of things, and this is all data we can collect, which again feeds into this. Okay, more data, more use for the AI. So I I I would say it's it's even more applicable in many ways, I think. Definitely. Um, well, if that question was quite tough, I think I have an even bigger question for you all. Um, let's see, uh, a question from Marty for both of you. Is answer. Marty Burke? Uh, yes. Yeah, that guy's <laughs> trouble already. I know it's going to be difficult. <laughs> Um, well, he asks, what are some of the currently unsolved problems that, if solved, could transform the landscape of sustainable chemistry? And are some of those problems potentially now newly solvable if we figure out how to harness the disruptive potential that the AI chemistry interface represents? That's a Marty Burke question, if I ever heard one. <laughs> Hi, Marty. Um, yeah, I, this is such an open-ended and very difficult question, you know, so I'll start with maybe some simple answers and perhaps open it up to thinking about um, more broad answers. I mean, I, I think the answer is, yes, the technology is in place to make important impacts to sustainability and to, you know, the chemical enterprise immediately and I'll give an example from my own lab because I'm quite familiar with it. And I just got updated on it last week, which was pretty exciting. And we were involved in a collaboration with Genentech on helping optimize a specific step, a really difficult chemical step in their process to make a new drug, um, which is in phase three clinical trials. And this was a live action optimization. They gave us the data, blinded of structure. Um, and we were able to suggest some new catalyst for their particular process that didn't improve the process. And that inspired a, another generation, which we weren't involved in, of, of improving this process, which has now been done on 1.5 metric tons. Um, and for a pharma synthesis, that's a pretty mm -hmm. large level. And this is not an inconsequentially simple step. And so that's a direct application of this. And I, I, I'm obviously very fond of it because we were involved in the early stages of it. But what it also did, I mean, again, this impact maybe is, is, is maybe not the right word, is basically now the higher ups at Genentech have now hired six data scientists, some with chemistry specific um, skill sets, including a former student or postdoc of mine, but uh, I think the important point there is, you know, this changed, it changed the direction they're going by using this tool set. Um, so that's a very specific kind of impact and sustainability. I will tell you the data science side of it was in, in nowadays the format pretty simple. But I think Marty's question, because I know Marty well, and we're old friends, Marty's question is, is much bigger. I mean, he's, he's essentially asking you know, where can't it actually impact? I think that's the question. And, you know, from new chemical reaction discovery that like maybe enables drug synthesis more efficiently to, you know, optimizers of any sort, you know, how do you make the process more optimal? And I think that area has been really, really going fast to, you know, holistic models, transfer learning is the tool, tool that people like to, or the term that people like to use, transferring one, one you know, one model to another, 
using you know machine learning as a as a, a a footstep from one reaction to another so we don't even have to run reactions all of this is possible and i would say on the sustainability front you know the impacts to energy research you know which connect to climate change which connect to um you know polymers in particular i think is a really interesting space absolutely i think it's ready to, it's it's ready for prime time with some with some of the caveats we already touched on which is you know how do you efficiently produce quality data that you can train your models on and chemistry still is a very difficult topic in that regard and jake spoke to it i work with a lot of collaborators who have high throughput labs and even then you know the results are not necessarily always uniformly predictable and reproducible because it's a complicated operation and automation helps, but it doesn't solve all of it. So I think we still have this kind of technology, data science and chemistry interface that is that needs to be thought about in each in, in, again, intentionally is a term I love using intentionally as you as we move forward. But Marty, we're gonna do it. I know you're I know you're all, all on deck on this. So Jake, I'll let you answer because you do have a more, I think, direct in, uh, direct involvement in these kind of problems. I mean, so when when we look at making things sustainable, and you know, this is often a challenge for us. We want a sustainable alternative to. So we have a product that works well in its application, but our customers asking us for a sustainable alternative with the same performance for the same price. Um, and again, that, that's not easy because the sustainable alternative will not be the same. It cannot be the same. The, the chemistry has to be different. Um, so we take the sustainable feedstock and, and, and we, we build the libraries of chemistries, but then we have to test. And depending upon the application of that particular chemical, there can be so many different tests we have to do. So uh, one of our ranges, we make dispersing agents for, for paint. So the, the additive disperses the pigment better, we get a better color strength, you don't have to put as much pigment in, pigment is the most expensive part of the coating. So, a good wetting dispersing agent allows our customer who makes paint to, to, to make more margin. But one job is to disperse the pigment. It's other jobs are not to screw the other things up. <laughs> and and you know, there's lots of complex interactions going on in these systems, which we don't understand. And, and we have absolutely no chance of understanding because they, for obvious reasons, they don't tell us what's actually in the rest of the paint. They say, this is the paint, this is the pigment, find us a good dispersing agent for it. Now find us a sustainable one for it. So then you've got multiple tests you have to do. First to see, is it doing the job it's been asked to do, but then is the coating still performing in all the other aspects that it needs to perform in? And, and again, this is a huge number of experiments to do and data points to collect. And I think it, it's something, you know, one of the reasons we're working so hard on this is because when we have enough of this data, then we can, you know, the longer term vision is we have to do fewer experiments in the future to find the right solution because we've got a big database that we can go into and find out, okay, so so we can learn, okay, this, this, this coating has similar properties to this one, therefore it's most likely to work with these particular agents or so that that's the direction we're moving into but right now we don't have enough data 
to do that. So this, I the think, <laughs> the, the, yeah. it's, it's now, now we need to generate the data, but now is the right time to be doing that because I, I think the, but machine learning, I think is, has become a wonderful tool for reaction optimization. And I think if, if you put that into a closed loop system, you can walk away from it and get it to send you a message when it's done, right? It's, it's that good already, but the, but that's the low hanging fruit. <laughs> No, I, 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 I worked in for a company who made automated systems for chemical research for a long time and, and reaction optimization process development was always the first thing. That was an easy sell because the analysis is all the same. You're looking to make one molecule better. So typically they're looking for one peak on an HPLC. <laughs> It, yeah, when you come into having multiple analytical techniques involved, and, and, and this is, again, we can go back to polymers and talk about that because there's multiple techniques we need to properly characterize a polymer before we can put it anywhere and find out how it works. Because if we don't understand what it is, it doesn't matter how it works because we can't really do a lot with it. We can't learn from that if we don't know what it is. So yeah, I think we have we have a lot of work to do. But um happily for me, that's super exciting because yeah, I I yeah, we're building the infrastructure to do those experiments. Yeah, I think the the, the thing that I constantly say as well is it's all about the assay, which is what you were just describing. Yeah. And so if it's a singular product you're optimizing for, which in We've done a lot with my team over the years. That's become pretty straightforward. I mean, it still has its challenges, of course, but you know, the different types of machine learning you can apply to that is is you know is is pretty straightforward. If let's say you want to predict how every coupling partner is going to work for a you know a traditional reaction, an amide coupling per se, or something like that, that is a much much more challenging problem because not only do you have the complexity of the molecules, but you have the complexity of the assay building. And polymers is another example where you have to look at five or six or maybe even 10 different, you know, metrics to describe such a, a the performance of, of a polymer or something like that. So the, this is the bottleneck um, on top of the fact that we don't have good enough data that's already available to, to build, you know, really comprehensive models. So um, I, I would say my group where we spend the most time is not on the ML side. It's still on the assay development side. It's still not having the proper assay development and um, trusting your assays and, and, and related. Definitely. Um, I think you all you know, throughout this whole thing have um, brought up specific examples of some gaps in in how things uh, can be done. So uh, maybe a little synthesis um, in this next question, but uh, either one of you can go first. Uh, what are the innovation gaps that you see when it comes to this area? I mean, I... Oh, it's, it's a tricky one. I, I, I think, I you know, I've talked about infrastructure you need to have the right infrastructure in place um i think the lack of negative results in data is is a is a big gap the i mean the other things we've already addressed are the the skill sets having the right people to be able to do this is something we need to work on data in the right format data accessible interoperable so we can it can be read by people and machines um and and then but i think probably the biggest thing for me is is the metadata we need to bring in with the experimental results and and how the molecules are described 
I was going to say exactly the same I, thing. I, I think that's the key. Yeah. And without that piece, it's, it, it's, it's really, really hard. Yeah, the, the dirty secret here, I mean, it, it, it is, you know, with large language models, which are really interesting, there's a ton of data out there and how to and how you describe them. The features are fairly straightforward. The molecules are more complicated, as I alluded to earlier, and how you describe them and what case use you have for those molecules and how do you, you know, so, so as an example, my lab has really worked hard through, again, this last 10 or plus years on bringing in, you know, quantum mechanical, physically relevant features of molecules into machine learning. Um, but within that alone, it's computationally very costly. That's one thing. The other part is which ones, right? And you kind of have almost unlimited access to really interesting features of molecules if you go this route, which we have. We usually go in with a hypothesis, but maybe we don't have that right. And so which ones is a real problem. So the the role of, you know, that this is this is the role of synthesis. If you put junk in, you get junk out. And that's also true with features. And that's also true with data quality. So um, if our data quality is but modest and sparse as well, and then use the wrong features, you can get a fit perhaps, but is it really doing what you want it to do? Is it going to be extrap? Can you extrapolate it? Can you interpret it? Interpret it? Can you do what you want with it? And that does come down to molecular features of whatever sort you need to use. Um, and that's a whole topic. I mean, there's reviews and reviews and reviews on this. That's a whole topic that is extremely difficult to navigate when you're new to this field. It's like which ones you use. Well, most people just use the cheapest ones because they're easy to get. And I will tell you, they're not necessarily going to help you out. There are occasions where they do work, so you can be misled occasionally. Oh. So that's the innovation gap. It's like no, that's where again, uh, knowledge is really important about machine learning. Is like the features matter, and in chemistry, they matter more than they do in most applications. Um, I know I, I'm preaching my own uh, gospel here because that's what we've worked on so hard. But, um, but I think that's it, that we have found over and over again that the quality of the features and the hypothesis going with is really important for for uh, effective modeling. Definitely. Um, so switching gears from innovation gaps to thinking about the future. Um, what all would you perceive as future opportunities for AI and sustainable chemistry? I think um, I think for us, um, it opens up a completely new direction. So at the moment, we use design of experiment software to, to design a lot of our experimentation but there's there's a limit to how much that can cope with um and if we think but if we think about applying machine learning to these sorts of problems and we have a closed loop system where i mean we, we give it some information at the start whatever we have it it says okay I will run these experiments next. Processes the data, says, okay, I will run these experiments now. And, and you can have that running in the background for as long as it needs to. And you know, you get to a point, okay, yeah, this is good enough now. Or we let it run for a bit longer. And and but but it is <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do. You need you need robust automation. You need the right data flow. You need the right algorithms to to analyze the data, and then the machine learning program to predict, tell you what to do next, and and and, and keep it running. But I, but I think it, if we can do that, small enough scale, so that we're not consuming huge amounts of raw materials then it, it it's it, it's a game changer for innovation and and for sustainability 
Yeah, I'll, I, I, I mean, this is exactly, you know, the, the, I think the plan in most industrial units. So that I think the interesting maybe question and comments I have on this, and we've been involved in a few of these closed loop auto automation optimizations for the, you know, it's usually using a, a Bayesian optimizer or something like mm -hmm. that. These have become very powerful and very popular very quickly. And, you know, obviously they've been around in other areas for a long, long time, but the, the interesting question that I like, because I have uh, my, I have a good friend, Abby Doyle has really been the pioneer, I think, in this space. And um, we talk a lot, we're in a center together. And the point I love making with her, and she agrees completely, I believe, is what happens when these optimizations actually fail? This is the most interesting part to me as an academic and you know, a trained organic chemist is when they fail is when you have to be smart. And so I think these optimizations, if they work, it's like you said, Jake, this is like, you know, you walk away tomorrow it works or however long it takes, great. But when it doesn't work is when you need to be innovative. And I, I call it, you need to do some sort of other intervention. Um, and that is interpret why it's failing. Um, not perhaps because of uh, experimental flaws, but more like what's going on with the chemistry that is so is 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 not allowing you to pass the threshold level of 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 you know optimization, and um, I call it you know an intervention of some sort with another machine learning technique perhaps, um, or just maybe get the old traditional stuff out and get in there and know your business. And I think this is kind of exciting to me because that's the part of chemistry that I love the most. It's like why isn't this working? I. I <laughs> And that's a really important part of training graduate students as well, because honestly, most PhDs, it's basically, why is this not working? It's not, why is this working? Because that's the easy part. So, um, yeah, so I, I think, I think that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I, and I think this is why we should not be concerned at all that it's the AI yeah. take over, because it, it can get stuck in its loop. Yeah, and, and my guess is that they get more sophisticated, they'll, this happens less, but um, the reality is we have to ask the right questions, and the reality is we have to be able to deal with the consequence of asking the wrong questions, mm -hmm. and when the AI gets sophisticated enough where none of this matters, well, I'll be retired, but um, <laughs> more importantly, I think, then you have to ask harder questions, right? That's and I get asked, and I have for a long time, so you're telling me a monkey can do this? That's one of my favorite questions from traditional organic chemists. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is actually really hard. And even though we are having technology, you know, jumps and I would say our productive, the productivity of my lab has gone way up and the number of successes of projects has gone way up. And, you know, I should probably someday try to quantify that. But ultimately, it means we can ask harder questions, right? And we're not stuck in mundane tasks. That's where we're at in, in, in mm -hmm. machine learning, in my opinion, is we, we don't have to be stuck in mundane tasks anymore. Like, am I gonna spend six months making this molecule is a really great question to ask before you make it, because it may not have the right attributes. So if you have someone, if you have a machine tell you that it's, it's, it's a low probability that it has what you want, that's a good starting day. And you just saved yourself six months. I mean, I mean, that's that's I think the most important kind of point, especially again in the graduate education field, because graduate students don't want to do something that takes six months and then they don't get the payoff for it. No one does. So yeah. that's the I think that's an important point. Sorry, I went off on my usual tangent there, but no. Uh, that was great, Matt, and thank you for like using um, the specific example at the end there um, that ties into one of our audience questions from James here, who asks, um, can you please give some specific examples where AI might ultimately be applicable? So I, I think we, we have a, a situation now um, where we uh, so we're working with uh, with a refinery group here, uh, 
So we make additives that go into diesel. Cold, cold flow improvers. So essentially when it gets cold, the, the waxes in the diesel settle out. And, and if you don't take care of that properly, the, the fuel pumps clog and it's a problem. Um, and the diesel that comes from the refineries, it, it, it's a natural product, it's constantly changing. So you get given a certain, so at a certain time of year, the, the refineries come and say, okay, this is, this is the diesel fuel that we want you to provide us an additive for. Um, we have 20 something additives, which then we combine together to make, to, yeah. So typically there's a specification from the customer it needs to, it needs to have a cloud point of this. It needs and and then there are other tests um, which we have to do, um, but you're typically bound by the um, by the amount of fuel you have. That gives you the number of experiments you do. So, and then you've got the design of experiments. So you. I mean, you do what you can with the fuel you have and 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 the time and the resource you have. But if you can put that into an with the miniaturization and and the AI driving it, potentially you can do more experiments or maybe even fewer experiments, but better informed experiments. I think DOE is great, but Basically, you just do all the experiments and then you look at them at the end. Intuitively, if you were doing it, you might go, oh, these ones don't look very good. We should stop doing those ones. But we typically don't. We just throw the horsepower at it, do it, and then crunch the numbers. So the AI there potentially gives us an improvement because it it's... It, it, it's constantly looking at the data. So, you know, we run however many we can run in a day. It crunches the numbers or we 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 even break it down further. We say, okay, we do 10 at a time. And then it tells us what to do next. Um, so, I, I, yeah, that's, that's one concrete example I can give without giving too much away. <laughs> yeah, I'll, um, maybe I'll... Uh, maybe I'll go less concrete and kind of talk about the different algorithms that are generally run in in my lab and a couple of my collaborators' labs. And there's so there's optimizers, and these would be process optimization. Let's say for a specific um, reaction step in a sequence to make a drug or 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 or, a, or, or a additive or whatever. And those, those can range from all types of different types of optimizers where you're looking at catalyst optimization or conditions optimization. So design of experiments is kind of the, it's the, it's the, it's, it's the OG of, of, of optimizers and one that we were certainly inspired by when we started um, a lot of our work. Um, and so those, those are kind of a standard of business in, 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 in the industry and also in my lab and, and, and many other labs where and there are various types of optimizations you can run where you use, you know, reaction outputs, you take some sort of features, you build some correlation and you try to extrapolate it. Um, and there are, again, various, various aspects of that. But, you know, kind of to the point that Jake just made, let's say you're trying to optimize something with lots of variables and you want to try to limit the number of data. There's optimizers that also um, have an active learning component. Basically, it learns each round of experiments and then suggests new ones. And, and these are really cool and very commonplace now in, in a very few number of years since you know people started reporting them in chemistry because they work and they work really well. They're kind of, I call it design of experiments on drugs. I mean, they're, they're, they're basically fewer experiments and they, the way that optimizers work is they you know, they, they, they build a fit and they figure out where in the, where in the, the um, response surface is there the most, let's say, um, probability issues, like you don't know what's going to happen. 
and it runs experiments there to get a better fit, or it goes for where's an area that we haven't even looked at yet, and we and we try to um, cover that space too to see what would happen. And you can adjust that. You can tune the the parameters to do that. So that's optimizers. There's also this kind of pushing chemistry, and 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 certainly I'm really interested in this. And you know, how do you generalize reaction types? And those are going to come apply a lot of different machine learning techniques from design of experiments, let's say, at the substrate scope and uh, using intentional design of uh, substrate uh, parameters to feed into um, your reaction optimization and look at the results of, as a function of substrate. I kind of, uh, this is akin to classic hammock chemistry, or hammock plots, but really much more sophisticated. You get a, a, a pretty broad view of that. And then you try to build um, uh, a model that will predict how all substrates will react under a particular reaction. This is really applicable to folks that are more in medicinal chemistry, because in that case, you have a core structure. You want to modify it systematically, but you want to know which reactions to use to modify it to streamline that, op that operation. Again, and perhaps use less costly goods and all this stuff can be used as metadata in your algorithms. Um, and then there's predictions of altogether new reactions, which I would say has been pretty uh, far away from us. There's generative models in this regard, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on them because I don't think there's been any super powered hits yet. There's some neat kind of teasers, but not really hits yet. Um, and that's, you know, at least in the synthetic organic chemistry arsenal, those are kind of what's been what's being go what's going on right now. So lots of possible applications with these simple. And they're mostly simple algorithms. If you talk to a computer scientist, they're like bored with it. But for chemists, they're actually fairly sophisticated. And design of experiments, to be honest, I mean, industry uses this all the time. But 10 years ago, if you would have went around to all the organic chemistry labs in, in, in academics, less than 5% would know what it was, including the PIs. So um, and it's extremely cool technic technique that engineers have been using for since the 1960s. So that's a standard of practice and it's very simple mathematics involved. So simple mathematics, except for you need a magical computer to do it. <laughs> uh, um, thanks a lot, Matt. Let's see, I think we have time for one more audience question here. Um, this one's a little bit big for thought, um, but Thomas asks, how do you envision we can use AI to reduce the cost of behaving sustainably on a manufacturing or global scale? Um, so I think, I mean, this, from the manufacturing point of view, I think, um, you know, we, we collect a lot of data when the plant is running. Um, and um, at the moment, I don't think we're using AI to analyze that data, but we're, we're running algorithms on it, right? And, and these algorithms are looking at, first and foremost, what's, what's the scope for energy efficiency? <laughs> This is a big thing, right? This can bring us sustainability, but then we're also looking at things like, um, I mean, there are various critical points within the plant, certain valves. We're looking at the, the power uptake from those sorts of things, which can then inform us, okay, is this looking like it might fail soon? Or do we need to maintain this already? And the, these sorts of these are the sorts of things that, that AI can help us to identify sooner. I think you know by by having this big database of you know and you know okay we've seen this before this is going to fail soon we need to shut down replace this so on and and I think you know you can then look at trends in the behavior of the reactions okay, this is getting a bit like that time when we it ran away from us and we can then intervene early and, 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 and stop 
those things happening. Um, so I think there's there's solutions in place looking into this already, but I think AI has some potential there to, to look at these things as they're happening and, and, and improve upon it. Yeah, I agree with that completely. I, I mean, I, I, I certainly am far away from this part of the operation in the chem, chemistry enterprise, you know, but um, let's say something becomes, um, some catalyst becomes precious for whatever, you know, global economic political reason. And so if you have a, a, a means to, you know, tr you know, model what would have the same basic properties, but isn't containing a certain metal, perhaps, um, or a certain, you know, ligand or a certain electrocatalyst or something like that, can you actually use predictive chemistry? And I don't know if that would be AI, but predictive chemistry to, to you know, pivot very quickly on something that's a really important commodity um, from one catalyst to another, rather than, you know, having to do a full optimization and, um, you know, the cost of redoing the process. Can that be done? And uh, I don't know the answer. I mean, that'd be super cool if it can, but that's the kind of thing I, I imagine, you know, with the complexity of the geopolitical situation and precious metals perhaps being the the really key problem there. And this could be, in, you know, for, for batteries for cars or for, you know, again, processes that come up in chemistry, um, plants and things of the sort, but that's, you know, one possibility but i i know little about manufacturing except i think it's pretty cool that what can be done on scale that's it just amazes me always yeah it's a totally different world <laughs> totally and i mean to jake's point the one thing i, I always am, it, it's really cool is they are getting real-time data that those are built for real-time data so it is definitely not far-fetched at all what Jake suggested. I think it's probably already happening in certain industries, you know, where they're taking real-time data and converting that into, um, you know, in terms of, in terms of a prediction of when to, you know, replace a part or um, maybe more importantly, when to, you know, warm and cool a, a plant um, and, and so on and so forth. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I know within the sort of process industry that, you know, they look at process robustness. So what, you know, what happens if, if the temperature runs away by five, 10 degrees? What happens if it comes down by five, 10 degrees? What happens if, if we give this too much shear or too little shear or how does that affect the end product? These, these are things with, once this data is fed into models that, that could then be predicted. And you, because the, these, these things are typically costly experiments to run because you have to run them at scale. Yeah. You could rise to a certain extent, but a lot of this stuff has to be done at the pilot scale. And, and there's, there's an investment in doing those experiments. So, Absolutely. Um, we're getting down to our last six minutes here. So I'm going to rein in our very last question for you all a little bit um, and get a little specific with what is the biggest lesson learned that you would like to share with us um, from doing these studies up to this point? I think... <sighs> I think for me, I mean, for us, I, I, I think AI is, is for me, not quite there for what we need it for. But I think also we're not quite there with our readiness for the AI. So I think for me, this, this is quite a pivotal and important point in time that we're preparing because the the pace of innovation in in the AI I mean they're they're going hard at this 
they're not going to slow down, right? And 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 as the models get better and computing power gets, computers get more powerful, it it, it it's going to come hard, and and we've got some some significant as I, I would say as an industry we've got some significant questions to answer and I, I i think the big ones how we bring what what is the right metadata to bring in and how the hell do we do that but i think now's the right time to be asking ourselves these questions and and putting this infrastructure this data into place and and this gives us the best opportunity to to get the most out of out of what's coming. Yeah, I guess uh, I'll finish on a really optimistic note. I what I'm always, um, and it's something that I felt for many years now. I, chemists can kind of do anything. That's what I like to think, um, because we we are taught in in a in a very early stage of hypothesis generation and then using whatever tool we need to learn how to, you know, attack the hypothesis. And, you know, what I have witnessed with my own research group over the last, you know, again, decade or so is this incredible thirst for, you know, using tools that, you know, even last week we wouldn't have tried. And um, so I think from the, you know, you know, the feeder of of Jake's team and all the teams that are going to be in industry is going to be academic units like like mine. And um, I'm very impressed with what young people are willing to do and how fearless they can be when they, you know, kind of see that this technique might really enable them solving a hard problem. And so I, I think I like to see it from that point of view. I mean, I understand what Jake said exactly. There is much to be done and learn um, before I think these things are kind of mainstreamed. But it's going to be the newer generation that do that. And the ones that are hybrid, you know, skills in terms of being chemists with data science tools engaged with that, these people are going to have superpowers and they are going to be all over the enterprise and um, I love I love pitching this in, in my grants and everywhere else I go because I, I feel it. I see it every day. These students are really, really capable of just changing the way we think about things. Lovely. We have a lot to look out for. Um, I want to thank uh, Matt and Jake one more time um, for their time in this very thoughtful and engaging conversation. Um, thank again, you. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and for the audience, uh, if you are interested in continuing uh, these conversations and um, joining more of AI plus Y conversation, you can register online and that link is posted in the chat. Um, for those of you who are interested in a deep dive on AI and sustainable chemistry, um, then please register for the upcoming 28th Annual ACS Green Chemistry and Engineering Conference, which will be held um, June 2nd to 5th in Atlanta, Georgia. And the registration link um, for that is also posted in the chat. Um, so again, thank you all one more time and thank uh, the audience for joining us here today.